So if I can hand you all over to Stephanie Holt, who's going to be doing the talk on Gilbert White and the Royal Society. Thank you. And Steph? No problem. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming along uh, this evening. Um, tonight's talk uh, is a little bit of a stand-in because we should have been joined by um, one of my colleagues, Jen, uh, from the Natural History Museum, talking to us about uh, some of the digitisation work we've been doing at the museum. But unfortunately, she's had to drop out for family reasons. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get Jen back to speak to us a little bit later on in the year. Um, so the talk I'm going to do for you this evening is on um, an aspect of Gilbert White, the naturalist, that I've been studying for the last couple of years. And one of the things that has got me so interested in Gilbert but White, aside from um, my general interest in him as a natural historian, um, has been the amount of time he spent outside of Selborne, uh, and particularly the amount of time he spent in London, and what influence that had on his opportunities, his connections, and his way of thinking. Um, so the talk I'm going to give uh, to you this evening is one that I haven't done as a, as a talk before, um, so you're going to have to forgive me a little bit, because uh, I'm going to have to check my notes on this one, I'm afraid. Um, but it's looking at Gilbert White and the Royal Society, and how the connections there led him, um, in part, towards the publication of his Natural History of Selborne. So the naturalist Reverend Gilbert White is best known for his publication, The Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne. In many ways, this account of the musings on natural history by one man in a small village in Hampshire could so easily have been consigned to really nothing more than the records of natural history literature, a footnote of publication history. And yet today, the book, and you can see um, a copy on the screen there, um, of the front page of the first one of the first editions held by uh, the Natural History Museum. But today it stands as the fourth longest constantly in print book in the English language, as it's to date never been out of print since per first publication in 1789. And you can see here two images of uh, two of the bookcases in the Gilbert White Museum in Gilbert White's house in uh, Selborne, just outside Alton. If you've not been to that museum yet, I strongly suggest going if you can. It's a fantastic place. But these two bookcases contain probably the largest collection of editions um, of just the one book, The Natural History of Selborne, um, which were all donated to the Gilbert White Museum. So the influence of this publication, and it has to be influential, you can see just from looking at all of those different volumes of just this one book, that, but the, its influence has been talked about many times. The natural history in many ways created a lot of what we do as a modern biological recorder, and it's influenced many people within the broad church of natural history, from a multitude of avid biological recorders, professional scientists, artists and poets even, to the great and the good of natural history, Sir David Attenborough being one, and Charles Darwin, who recorded in his own journals a pilgrimage, as he described it, to Selborne, to see Gilbert White's home and the village he paints such a beautiful portrait of in his writing. But what is discussed less frequently, however, is White's first publications, monographs read and published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. These letters published in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society were the testing ground in a lot of ways for, for interest in publication of his observations, and it's these publications and how they came about that I want to discuss today. So when we think of Gilbert White, we instantly find ourselves drawn to the image of him portrayed and popularized, popularized through his numerous biographies, that of a petite, quiet, thoughtful man rooted in the village of Selborne near Alton in Hampshire. Here, um, this is a photograph I took of the fold-out frontispiece uh, to the first editions of the Natural History of Selborne. This is one of the museum's ones. And you can see here, you know, it's, it's a very famous engraving, but it very much shows the place of this book. This rural idyll nestled within the hills of the East Hampshire hangars that might 
that perhaps is Gilbert climbing the hill there, extolling on the virtues of the wildlife that he finds in the village. And it is in many ways that image of the green hills of England, which is partly responsible for the longevity of his book. However, while Gilbert clearly adored Selborne, his garden and the wildlife he found within it and around it, he wasn't an entirely untraveled man. Through reading White's personal journals, his garden calendar and his correspondence, we can see a more rounded picture of the man and his journeys within England. He didn't travel abroad. As a student, he was to be found in Basingstoke and then in Oxford, where he studied at Oriel College. That's Oriel College, you can see at the top there. And the image that I use on the title slide and repeated here is actually one of only two drawings done of Gilbert in life. We don't really know too much about what he looked like. It's a sketch penned by a friend of his into the margins of a copy of Pope's translation of Homer's Iliad, which he was awarded at graduation while at university. Now, university, we see a slightly different picture of, of uh, Gilbert. At Oriel, he gained the nickname of Busser White. Now, Busser in this instance is, is popular slang of the time for kisser. And this tiny little glimpse implies he was perhaps not always the shy retiring clergyman written portraits of him in his later years might give the impression of. Indeed, even when deep in his studies in older years, he clearly adored visitors and parties and companionship. And actually in some of his um, notes, you see him getting quite sad and almost depressed um, when guests leave. Now, post-graduation, he travelled to Oxford with some regularity, and he would have known that route well. He also knew the route to um, Sussex well. As a dutiful nephew, he headed east to visit his aunt, Rebecca Snook, and Ringer in Sussex. And it's these journeys, and he, you know, he's probably best known on those journeys for um, uh, acquiring himself, his pet tortoise, Timothy. But we also see the development of Gilbert as a botanist. In his uh, journals, we suddenly see the sudden clearing of his plant blindness, to use the modern term, and his passion for identifying and recording plants overcomes him, and his journals become lists of plants seen and identified in his journeys. So his travels did influence his writing. But he wasn't a fan of long journeys, and he appears to have suffered, um, judging by some of his correspondence, from coach sickness. He's often chastised by his brother John for not visiting him in Lancashire, and he had to refuse Thomas Pennant's offer to visit Flintshire, as he just couldn't bring himself to face the journey. However, he did regularly visit his two brothers who lived in London, Thomas White, latterly Thomas Holt White, and Benjamin White. So this is the John Rock map. Uh, from 1746 that shows the extent of London as Gilbert would have known it. And if you zoom into various parts of this map, you'll see that it's in exquisite detail. It's an incredible piece of cartography for the period. So this is the city that Gilbert would have got to know and its surroundings. And for many people who've read the natural history of Selborne, the concept of Gilbert in London sits rather strangely. And yet it's clear from his notes that he enjoyed visiting his brothers and the city itself. His surviving correspondence with friends and relations talks of visiting various places around the city and includes observations on natural history and London life, including activities such as walking in St James's Park and visiting the Laverian collection. Of course, living in London, being in London, sorry, didn't stop him from being an avid biological recorder. We all know as naturalists ourselves that very little ever really stops us from observing wildlife. And one of the best hints of the dates that he was in London actually come from the records um, from when he was there. I'll just play this quick one, hopefully, which will work. So we can see there saw um, recordings of seeing Martins uh, in Fleet Street, um, which would be wonderful today. Um, but they give us records and indications as to when he was there in London and when he was present in the city. And of course, in the very best traditions of natural history, still making records. 
Now, White's biographers have focused on his work in Selborne, quite rightly so. There's only been one paper out of the many on White uh, looking at his activities in the city, written by June Chatfield in 1992 and published in the uh, Journal of the London Natural History Society. And there have been two papers on his brother Benjamin White's publishing activities, 1994 and 1982. However, he visited the city frequently normally staying with his brother Thomas in Thames Street. Oops, apologies for that. So we're back to the map. And this is Thames Street, where Thomas uh, White originally lived. Um, and this one's actually quite interesting, this location, because Thames Street is the road which runs from the Tower of London. You can see the tower here. Um, and that means that Gilbert would have been in range of the menagerie, which would have still been in uh, the Tower of London, but he never mentions it. Um, other writers talk about being able to hear lions roaring from, from the tower, but, but Gilbert never mentions that in any of the notes, at least that I've seen so far. Thomas then moved uh, to South Lambeth. That arrow is slightly fuzzy because I haven't yet tracked down quite where in South Lambeth he, um, he was living although I'm getting closer. Um, I'm particularly interested in that because today I'm speaking to you from South Lambeth Road um, in London, and I'm really fascinated to know just how close uh, Thomas Holt White and Gilbert, of course, were when they were here. But it's, it's this location here that I'm more interested in today. And this is the location of his brother, Benjamin. Brother Ben lived and worked in Fleet Street. And it's, this is the sort of scene that Gilbert would have seen when he was when he was visiting him there. And this is particularly interesting because when it comes to the Whites in London, this focus on Fleet Street is particularly useful to us. Now this is Benjamin White and this is where the link to the Royal Society starts. Benjamin was a publisher with a bookshop at the sign of Horace's Head and that is the description that we get. Now we don't really know what Horace's head would have looked like. My assumption at the moment, at least, is that it's probably an image of the Roman poet. It fits with the concept of it being a publishing house. But beyond that, Horace's head itself is long gone. However, I can now tie down the exact location of this, um, this site. I've pulled down um, this one quote from uh, Gilbert White's uh, journals from July the 12th 1791. On this day brother Benjamin White began uh, oops, sorry, I've got a thing in the way, began to rebuild his house in Fleet Street which he had entirely pulled to the ground. His grandson Ben White laid the first brick of the new foundation and then presented the workmen with five shillings for drink. Ben, who is five years old, may probably remember this circumstance hereafter and may be able to recite to his grandchildren the occurrences of the day. Well, I don't know necessarily how many five-year-olds that Gilbert knew at this point, because I'm not sure how many five-year-olds would remember that sort of thing uh, when they're grown up. But uh, nevertheless, it was a really important point for the family. The original publishing house, the publishing house at which Gilbert White's book was published, was pulled to the ground. It was destroyed. Um, so we've got a bit more information going on about this location, about this building. Interestingly as well, um, this, um, this date was actually the last date that Gilbert visited London. He died two years later. Um, this was the last time though that he actually managed to travel to the city. Um, and he mentions the night before um, the number of whites who had managed to gather together for this uh, important event for the family. Um, I think he mentions 14 whites sitting around the table for dinner uh, the night or two before. Now, biographies have given the location of, um, of Benjamin's publishing house as 63 Fleet Street. But it's known that that building was destroyed and another built. So we've got that, in, that piece of information. Um, by searching through the London Metropolitan Archives, I've, I've managed to find the original fire insurance document for 63 Fleet Street in the name of Benjamin and John White, booksellers. Uh, so we have that address completely confirmed. But the question that's remained for a lot of us is whether or not the current site of 63 Fleet Street is the location of where 
Benjamin's 63 Fleet Street was, or if street numbering has changed. Now, 63 Fleet Street today, you can see it on the photograph on the left hand side there. It's an optician's, um, and it's but it's housed in a building which was constructed for the Scotsman newspaper. And the article on the right hand side, not expecting you to, to uh, get the uh, magnifying glasses out there and trying to read the article, um, but that's a, uh, an edition of the Scotsman uh, from Friday, of March the 31st, 1922. And that's celebrating the the new building for the Scotsman. If you look very carefully um, on the photograph on the left hand side, you can see it just up in the uh, where you've got those uh, little uh, balconies, little Juliet balconies. They're all decorated with an S for the Scotsman, and the uh, ironwork around it is all uh, thistles taken from uh, the Scotsman's logo. But would there be anything remaining from the original 63 Fleet Street, perhaps in the foundations of that site? Did intrigue me, so I started digging a little bit further, and unfortunately it appears not. The original 63 Fleet Street was close by, but it's not on the location of the original 63, number 63. Fortuitously, and completely by accident actually, um, I found a receipt uh, lodged somewhat incongruously in the archives of the Wiltshire and Swindon Heritage Centre, and this is it, and again I'm not going to try and ask you to pore over the handwriting there, um, but it was in Wiltshire and Swind Swindon Heritage Centre, and this is for the sale, it's a receipt for the sale of 63 Fleet Street by Benjamin White, you can see his uh, signature in the bottom corner there. It's dated 1791, and it was a receipt to the Earl Radnor of Longford Castle. Um, it's for the sale of 63 Fleet Street for the sum of £739, and it's uh, to enable compulsory purchase of the property to enable them to open a new street from Fleet Street to Temple Street in the City of London. Now that street is Bouverie Street uh, that exists today. Um, unfortunately, that means that the location of the old 63 Fleet Street is under tarmac, which is gonna make it really difficult to hang a blue sign on uh, if we wanted to hang one of uh, English Heritage's uh, blue plaques on the original location of this. Um, so it's somewhere underneath the tarmac about where that orange arrow is. But why is the location of Gilbert's Brothers Publishing House important? Well, Benjamin was a specialist printer, particularly publishing natural history books. He was, of course, Gilbert's publisher for the natural history of Selborne, but otherwise he's known for a whole wealth of other publications, probably best known for his publication of Thomas Pennant's British Zoology, but he published many other works of natural history too. But his location was genius, it was ideal for this sort of work. As you can see, the then 63 Fleet Street, pointed up by that arrow, is almost opposite the entrance to Crane Court, up in the top left here. Now Crane Court today um, comes out uh, through a little archway, um, it's a very small little entranceway that you see today, just off Fleet Street, it takes a little bit of uh, work to try and find it, but it still exists. And Crane Court was the then home of the Royal Society. They moved there in 1710 and stayed there until 1780. So it was a well-established location. And of course, many eminent natural historians of the day were members. It was also close to the now demolished Mitre Tavern. Well, those are some images there of the Royal Society. That's the end of Crane Court. Um, so that's the entrance to Crane Court or what would have been a... Um, uh, just slightly off the end of the uh, uh, map there, and that's what discussions in the War Society may have looked like. An old mitre court down there is the location of the Mitre Tavern, which is the home, if you like, of the Club of the Royal Philosophers, the dining club of the Royal Society, where they would all have gone for a drink, uh, I assume, um, after talks. Now, this is important because fellows of the Royal Society and esteemed scientists and naturalists of the day, such as Joseph Banks, Daniel Solander, Danes Barrington and Thomas Pennant, would have gone to meetings at Crane Court and they would have strolled out um, and almost the first thing they would have seen would have been a publisher and purveyor of natural history books. Now I'm sure we all know ourselves as naturalists, a, pub a publishing house for natural history books, a bookshop selling them, would have been an almost 
un walk past a ball temptation. We'd have all gone in, wouldn't we? Um, and of course, that means that they would have all have gone into the bookshop and they'd have all have met there. They would all have known Benjamin White, who himself was a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and also Thomas White was also a fellow of the Royal Society as well. So that gave access for Gilbert, not only to the latest publications from his brother's bookshop, but also to their authors and to other naturalists. Those are people, of course, that he could discuss his ideas with, something that he very definitely, from reading his letters, knew that he was sorely lacking when he was back down in Hampshire. He wrote quite often to Pennant, to Barrington, and also to people like Bank, uh, Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander, asking them if they would like to visit him in Selborne so he could show them some of the things that he was finding. But unfortunately, none of them ever did manage to make it down. So this opportunity to meet and discuss his ideas with people would have been incredibly enticing to Gilbert to come up to London. Um, so there are allusions in his letters to meeting with many of these people while he's up there, including Danes Barrington showing him and his nephew Jack uh, the collections of the Royal Society and meeting with um, Joseph Banks and Daniel Saunders shortly before their famed journey on the endeavour. And it's likely that meetings like this were extremely influential on the development of Gilbert as a naturalist. Now, Thomas Pennant, we know from uh, the Natural History of Selborne, he was Gilbert's first known correspondent in natural history. And it was likely prompted by Benjamin and the letters um, to Pennant make up the first half of the Natural History of Selborne itself. Crucially, it's Pennant who seems to have introduced White to Danes Barrington, who's this chap on the left here with the rather fantastic wig. White's letters to Barrington total 66 in the Natural History of Selborne, but it's likely that there are many others on subjects aside from Selborne, which were not included in the publication. We need to remember that the natural history is not a complete record of correspondence, but a story of Selborne and Gilbert's findings within Selborne, delivered by the means of some of those letters. The two were clearly aware, and that's Barrington and, and Gilbert, were clearly aware of each other earlier than this, though, through a shared correspondence with Pennant. And importantly, before they met, Barrington sent White a copy of his own publication, The Naturalist Journal, uh, which I've got a copy of here, which hopefully you can see, which was a diary specifically for keeping natural history records which was pivotal in how White um, managed his, his biological records. And he changes his recording scheme from his normal notebooks and diaries to copies of the Naturalist Journal uh, once he's received that. Now, White and Barrington met in May 1769. We know that because letter one to Danes Barrington in the Natural History of Selborne, dated 30th of June 1769, intimates that White and Barrington had met in person for the first time the previous month. Now, White, from his own journals, was in London from the 25th of April to the 13th of May. So that meeting must have occurred during that visit. So it's likely to have been early May or perhaps late April. Their correspondence from that point carries on for at least 17 years. And from references in these, it clearly included several meetings in London. While we know next to nothing of how these meetings and conversations in person might have gone, we do know of their effect. Long correspondence and sharing of thoughts and ideas in natural history that shaped how Gilbert thought and wrote. But not only that, there was also opportunities to publish. And these two quotes that I've got here are from letter five to Barrington in the Natural History of Selborne. Um, they, uh, so this is from the 12th of April 1770, and they're quite important statements. When we meet, I, will be, I shall be glad to have some conversation with you concerning the proposal you make of my drawing up an account of the animals in this neighbourhood. Followed by, your partiality towards my small abilities persuades you, I fear, that I am able to do more than is in my power, for it is no small undertaking for a man unsupported and alone to begin a natural history from his own autopsia. So there's, those are really quite interesting statements. Clearly Barrington is very interested in what White is doing, and what he's talking about with all of his recording, and he's trying to encourage White to share this information with other people. But Gilbert is somewhat reticent about doing this. And 
this appears to have been the case in a couple of other situations as well. P Thomas Pennant proposed that they worked on a new periodical devoted to natural history together in 1768. And again, Gilbert was keen on the idea, but didn't seem convinced that he was the right person to help out with that. Um, so he seems to have been somewhat reticent in, in this publication idea. But Barrington clearly persisted. And it was at his request that White's monographs to the Royal Society came about. Now, Barrington had already discussed White's work at the Society, as his letter here um, from 1772 attests. Now, again, I'm not going to ask you to read uh, Danes Barrington's handwriting. These are photographs that I took from the Royal Society archives a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see the date of 1772 up in the top left there, and Danes Barrington's signature. Uh, down at the bottom right. I'll just zoom in there though. Um, just to this starting point of the letter. I sent herewith a bird which the Reverend Mr White of Selborne in Hampshire desires, I think that's desires, uh, the Royal Society would do him the honour to accept of. So this is fascinating because Danes is not just talking about uh, Gilbert White, but he's also suggesting that a bird specimen has been sent to the Royal Society collections, which um, now that interests me and is a complete sideline. Um, I, um, the Royal Society's collections ended up at uh, the Natural History Museum. There is a chance that somewhere unlabeled in our collection is that specimen. Um, and uh, at some point I need to find the time to go and see if it's possible. Um, to, to track down where that might have been. Um, but it's Barrington um, who's promoting Gilbert at the Royal Society, and Barrington who suggested that Gilbert write a letter on his observations of the house martin or martlet to be read at the Royal Society. And it's Barrington who saw that it was read on the 10th of February 1774. So this, um, I've included the link down here, this isn't directly into the website, but this is from the Royal Society's Turning the Pages website, which if you haven't seen it before, it's a fantastic repository um, of um, various different elements of their archive collection. And this means that you can go to that website link um, that I've got there. Actually, if you just go to the first part, you'll find it. Um, but you'll be able to scroll through the letter as if you were reading uh, the full letter and you can zoom right in. And I think there's a transcript of it so you don't have to try and um, uh, translate Gilbert's handwriting either. But you can see at the top here, read uh, February the 10th, 1774. Um, so that's Gilbert White's first published piece, if you like. Uh, it's read at the Royal Society and then later published in Philosophical Transactions. We know that that letter was well received from the comment that's associated with it in uh, the publication in Philosophical Transactions. And a second monograph broadening the subject matter to Swift's, Swallows and Martins and Gilbert's observations on their behaviour was submitted on the 4th of November 1774 um, and read at the Society in March 1775 and then published in Philosophical Transactions later that year. And this is my photograph, um, again, from the Royal Society's archives. And you can see um, the letter uh, in the centre there, uh, dated November the 4th, 1774, in Gilbert's handwriting. It's um, on both sides of that page. Now, doubtless, the response to this gave him confidence that there was real interest in his findings and that his observational method of recording in detail a species behaviour had real value in an environment where it was usual to only consider the anatomy of a species, not necessarily its interactions with the world around it. Indeed, a third monograph on the nightjar was proposed, but sadly it was never completed and never sent to the Royal Society as publication on the natural history began to take precedence and pretty much all of Gilbert's time. However, it is this confidence and this opportunity which led eventually to the publication of his masterpiece, which is so loved, so inspirational and so influential still today. So the question remains that without London, without the Royal Society and this opportunity to publish, and particularly without Danes Barrington, would we have actually had Gilbert Selborne? I'm just going to finish on this last image of Gilbert White, um, which is uh, taken from 
a colorized version of that original sketch um, that I showed you earlier on. Uh, the colorized version uh, belongs to uh, the Gilbert White Museum. Uh, I believe it was done by one of their volunteers. Um, and we took um, in 2019 uh, a copy of that colorized version and we digitized it using images taken from our digitized collections of UK natural history. And that original specimen, uh, specimen, uh, <laughs> portrait uh, is now in um, our uh, atrium for the Centre for UK Biodiversity. So if you ever find yourself popping in to the centre, you'll be able to look close up on that and see all the multitude of digitised uh, natural history specimens that make up that portrait. And it's one of my favourite things. So I thought I'd show it right at the end. Um, but that's me uh, on Gilbert White and, um, and his connection to the Royal Society. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, well done, Steph. That was that was 